Be sure to order your copy of the Go Go Offense by Coach Brennan Marion on footballgameplan.com slash go go offense. Coach Marion goes through the ins and outs of his explosive offense, one that's tearing up the college football field and putting a lot of points on the scoreboard. Again, you can order your copy at footballgameplan.com slash go go offense. Michael Buchalam, and this is your football game plan Big Sky Conference Whip Around. Eastern Washington is off to a rough start so far in 2019. After losing to Pac-12 power Washington University in Week 1, the Eagles rebounded nicely with the win against Lindenwood the following Saturday. Eric Barriere has played well with five touchdown passes and was helped by Antoine Custer, who had 184 yards on the ground. But that wasn't enough, as the Gamecocks triumphed over the Eagles 49-45 in a high-scoring affair. The UC Davis Aggies are off to a good start in 2019 as well with a 2-1-1 record, only losing to Cal in their opener. In a home game in Week 3, the Aggies dominated Lehigh 41-13. Jake Meyer was on fire this week, throwing for nearly 400 yards and four touchdown passes. Carson Crawford was his main target as he had nine grabs for 148 yards and a score through the air. Running back Alonzo Gilliam had a score on the ground but only amassed 78 scrimmage yards, which was a poor showing after he rushed for 135 last week against San Diego. Week 4 has a tough matchup for the Aggies as they face the North Dakota State Bison. After they cruised to victory over Southeastern Missouri State 38-17 last week, Montana State followed up with a hard-fought road victory versus Western Illinois. Corey Bauman had another game in which he threw for less than 200 yards and no scores, but again, he was bailed out by the run game. This week, the bell cow was Logan James, who ran for 167 yards and two touchdowns. Kicker Tristan Bailey was also a standout performer, going 3-for-3 three three in a windy Leatherneck Stadium. The Bobcats are looking to extend their two-game winning streak with a home matchup versus Norfolk State. Northern Arizona is off to a flying start offensively in 2019, as their offense has put up at least 37 points in each game, even the Week 2 loss against the Arizona Wildcats. This week, Case Cookus dominated New Mexico with another impressive outing, 357 yards and four scores through the air. If he can keep this up, the Lumberjacks will have a great chance of beating Illinois State this week. Sacramento State and Montana also have two inward records thus far. The Grizzlies will look to rebound from a tough loss to Oregon last week with a home victory against Monmouth. A cross-country road trip should prove difficult for the Hawks, who also have to contend with an offense that's averaging 32 points per game. The Hornets might be the most impressive team so far in the Big Sky, as their offense is averaging 45 points per game while only giving up 26 points so far in their three outings. That'll be all put to the test as they play another FBS team in the Fresno State Bulldogs this week. Idaho, Cal Poly, Portland State, Weber State, and Southern Utah all sit at 1-2 and two after Week 3. There's plenty of talent on each of those squads, so they'll look to get their seasons back on track once conference play begins. The lone 0-3 team in the Big Sky, Northern Colorado, needs their defense to step up and keep a team under 35 points if they want to get their first tally in the win column. Up next for the Bears is South Dakota. That's all for the Big Sky Conference whip around for Week 3. I'm Ike Buchalam. Week three in the Big South is come and gone. Before we get into week four's action, let's take a look back at the weekend that was. Number nine, Kennesaw State went on the road and took down Alabama State 42-7. The Owls got off to a quick start, scoring three times in the first quarter in their route. Both Bronson Recksteiner and Antavius Greer had touchdown runs of over 50 yards in the win. Defensively, Demetrius Petaway had a 35-yard pick six. Kennesaw State outgained Alabama State 481-45 to on the ground. Charleston Southern took on number 15 North Carolina A&T and nearly pulled off the upset over the Aggies at home. 
Jack Chambers connected with Cameron Brown on a 33-yard pitch and catch in the first. And in the second, Chambers found the end zone on a one-yard run. The Buccaneers held the Aggies to just two field goals through three quarters. But at the start of the fourth, A&T scored 21 straight before Southern rounded out the scoring in their 27-21 loss. The Gardner-Webb run and Bulldogs earned their first win of the year by holding NC Central to just four field goals in their 21-12 win. Kalen Withlow had a five-yard TD run, while Jalen Cagle had touchdown runs of one yard and 65 yards. The senior running back finished the day with 141 yards on 23 carries. The running Bulldogs also forced three interceptions in the win. Hampton defeated Howard 41-20 at Soldier Field in Chicago Saturday afternoon behind a monster game from DeAndre Francois. Francois completed 11 passes for 217 yards and four scores in the win. Three of the four touchdown passes came in the second quarter. First, Francois found Darren Butts for a 70-yard score and later found Jadakiss Bonds for a 68-yard touchdown. Bonds had three catches and two scores in the win. Monmouth led 21-0 early Saturday, but needed overtime to defeat Albany 38-35. Matt Mascara connected on two field goals in the first quarter, but neither were bigger than the 25-yarder he connected on in overtime to lift the Hawks to their second straight win. Kenji Bahar completed 23 of his 37 passes for 291 yards and three scores. Lonnie Moore the fourth caught five passes for 76 yards and two touchdowns. Running back Pete Guerrero had 30 carries and four catches for 179 total yards and a touchdown in the win. North Alabama fell 31-24 to in-state rival Alabama A&M on Saturday. The game was tied at 21 after three, but North Alabama was outscored 10-3 in the fourth. Lions kicker Joe Gurley connected on four field goals in the loss. Running back Terrence Humphrey had 123 yards on 15 carries and a score, while Dexter Boykin caught three passes for 132 yards. Presbyterian lost to Jacksonville 30-20 Saturday night. The Blue Hose led 13-7 at the break, but Jacksonville outscored them 23-7 in the second half. Running back Jarius Jeter had 106 yards on 13 touches in the loss. Offensively, Jacksonville outgained Presbyterian 316-206. Before we get into Week 4's action, let's take a look at the updated Big South standings. There's a three-way tie at the top with Kennesaw State, Hampton, and Monmouth all sitting at 2-1. and one. Campbell is 1-1 one one coming off a of bye. North Alabama and Gardner-Webb are both 1-2, while Presbyterian and Charleston Southern are still winless. Kennesaw State moved up two spots in this week's Stats FCS Top 25 to number 7, and they hit the road for a third straight week, this time traveling to Missouri State. The Owls have the fifth most yards on offense in the FCS through three games, while their defense has allowed just 668 yards, the sixth fewest in the country. Three Big South opponents hit the road to take on top 25 teams this week. First, Monmouth heads to Montana to take on the number 19 Grizzlies. It's Montana's second game against a Big South foe as they took down North Alabama 61-17 two weeks back. The Hawks are ranked both 34th in passing and rushing yards through three games. 0-3 Charleston Southern faces the Citadel on Saturday. The Bulldogs are ranked 25th after winning at Georgia Tech last weekend. The Buccaneers have been outscored 145-44 through three games this season. North Alabama brings a two-game losing streak to Jacksonville as they take on number 10 Jacksonville State. Lions quarterback Christian Lopez has a conference-best 857 passing yards this season. Presbyterian looks for their first win as they host Eastern Kentucky in Week 4. Quarterback Brandon Thompson leads the team with 150 passing yards and 76 rushing yards through two games. The Fighting Camels of Campbell are coming off a bye and they'll host 3-0 Davidson. Freshman quarterback Haj Malik Williams has 320 yards and four touchdowns through the air in two games. He also leads the team with 95 yards on the ground. Hampton is coming off a win over Howard and will head to Liberty to take on the FBS Flames, a former Big South team. 
The Pirates will need to rely on their former FBS quarterback, DeAndre Francois, who's coming off a monster game last week. Lastly, Gardner-Webb travels to Wofford to take on the 0-2 Terriers. Running Bulldogs running back Jalen Cagle ranks third in the Big South with 265 yards on 54 touches through three games. That will do it for this week in the Big South. Come back next week for all the results and more. For the FCS Conference Whip Around, I'm Frank LaSala. It was another interesting week in the CAA. 20th ranked Delaware was outgained 268 yards to 29 in the first half by first ranked North Dakota State. They were down 33 to 8 after three quarters before gaining most of their yards and scoring two touchdowns in garbage time. The Blue Hens lost 47 22. Albany lost to Monmouth in a heartbreaker. Quarterback Jeff Undercuffler threw for 398 yards and four touchdowns. He also threw three interceptions. Undercuffler's favorite target was Jawan Green, who caught 15 passes for 248 yards and three touchdowns. However, it was Gerard Reeves who caught Undercuffler's 21-yard pass for a touchdown with four seconds left to send the game to overtime. The Great Danes got the ball first in overtime, but the drive ended with Dylan Burns missing a 39-yard field goal attempt. Monmouth got the ball down to the 8-yard line, and Mount Mascara kicked a 28-yard field goal to put down Albany 38-35. Second-ranked James Madison obliterated Morgan State 63-12. The Dukes dominated all facets of the game. The offense gained 507 yards, and quarterback Ben DiNucci threw for four touchdowns. The defense held the Bears to 2 of 13 on third down. Even special teams had a great game. They blocked an extra point in the fourth quarter and also had Devin Ravenel return an onside kick for a touchdown in the dominant win. 22nd-ranked Villanova dominated Bucknell 45-10. The Wildcats scored 35 unanswered points, starting with Jaquan Amos' 34-yard interception return for a touchdown on the third play of the game. Quarterback Daniel Smith had two passing touchdowns and one rushing touchdown in the first half. He added another passing touchdown in the second half. Elon quarterback Davis Cheek threw a career-high five passing touchdowns to five different receivers when the Phoenix took on Richmond in their conference matchup. There wasn't much to rave about in Richmond's performance other than receiver Keiston Fuller. He had an impressive 208-yard game along with a touchdown. However, it wasn't enough to keep the game close. 25th-ranked Elon took this one 42-20 over the Spiders. Stony Brook dominated the first three quarters in their game against Wagner, taking a 26-3 lead and holding the Seahawks to only 113 yards before they more than doubled that in the fourth quarter, finishing with 259 yards. Isaiah White ran for 131 yards and two touchdowns, being a key reason to the Seawolves' 26-10 win. William & Mary got off to a hot start and finished strong against Colgate, adding another loss to their winless record. The Tribe went up 17-0 in the first quarter. Colgate was blanked until a rushing touchdown a minute before the half. A 21-yard field goal brought Colgate within a touchdown with 7 minutes and 16 seconds left in the third quarter. But on the kickoff, Bronson Yoder returned at 93 yards for a score and a two-touchdown lead. Colgate didn't score again, and William & Mary went on to win 38-10. New Hampshire lost a back-and-forth game against FIU 30-17. The Panthers' rushing attack was too much to handle for the Wildcats, rushing 52 times for 310 yards and three touchdowns. Quarterback Tom Flacco, younger brother of CAA alum Joe Flacco, threw for 224 yards and two touchdowns, along with an interception when he helped 8th-ranked Towson decisively beat 7th-ranked and CAA defending champion Maine. Flacco also led the team in rushing, taking 7 carries, 68 yards. Another major contributor to the Tigers' win was running back Yidi Thanrat, who had four short yardage touchdowns on the day. Black Bears quarterback Chris Ferguson threw for an impressive 401 yards. However, he threw four interceptions in the 45-23 loss. The CAA is represented in this week's top 25 by the same six teams that represented them last week. However, most of them are shuffled around. James Madison remains at second after their big conference win. Tileson jumps up to fifth. On the losing end of that game, Maine dropped to 12th. Villanova continues to rise, coming in at 18th. Delaware dropped two spots to 20th. Elon moves up to 22nd. Now a preview into the games in Week 4. 12th ranked Maine looks to rebound against Colgate. 22nd ranked Elon hopes to continue their strong start against Wake Forest. 20th ranked Delaware hosts Penn. Albany takes on Lafayette. 
second-ranked James Madison goes on the road to face Chattanooga. William and Mary travels to East Carolina to take on the Pirates. New Hampshire gets a visit from Rhode Island for a conference matchup. Stony Brook hosts Fordham. And finally, in an exciting conference matchup, Tom Flacco and fifth-ranked Towson goes up against 18th-ranked Villanova in a defense that is giving up only 11.3 points a game, which is fourth-best in the nation. For the FCS Whip Around, I'm Dylan Seaslick. I'm Zachary Morgan, and I've finally been let out of my crypt, which can only mean one thing. Ivy League football is about to begin. Cornell is traveling to Marist to take on the Red Foxes Saturday, marking not only the first ever meeting between these programs, but the first time the Big Red will face an opponent from the Pioneer Football League. The Red Foxes have started out the year 1-1 one one after winning last week's home opener against Stetson, 26-23. With quarterback Dalton Banks graduating, junior Richie Kenny and senior Mike Catanese will both see time at quarterback this season. Kenny saw limited time last season in pass-first situations, while Catanese was mostly used in a wildcat or run-first type of role. In addition to using a platoon quarterback system, Archer is also set to use some new schemes in order to better position his players for success. Running back Harold Coles is coming back and will undoubtedly be the centerpiece of this offense. He should soak up at least 15 to 20 touches a game. On defense, Archer says senior corner David Jones is among the top players at his position and should make an impact in both the passing game and on special teams as a returner. Cornell will hope to start the season on a high note and ride that momentum into next week's game against Yale. The Columbia Lions take on the St. Francis Red Flash on the road to kick off their season Saturday. The Red Flash have started the season 2-1, including a 42-14 walloping of Merrimack last week. The Lions will look to cool them off as Columbia begins their campaign. Junior quarterback Josh Bean looked ready to go when leading the first-team offense against Montclair State a couple weeks ago. Senior captain Josh Wainwright has been itching to get back on the field since tearing his ACL last season. Although it is the beginning of the season, a difficult Ivy League schedule has the Lions in a near-must-win situation already. Columbia has the unenviable task of playing Princeton, Yale, and Dartmouth on the road this season and can ill afford to lose games outside the conference this year. Dartmouth will begin their season traveling to Jacksonville to take on the 1-1 one one Dolphins. Captain Isaiah Swan was quoted recently as describing the defense as tough and nasty. The senior corner was named to the Stats FCS preseason All-America first team and will lead the defense alongside co-captain linebacker Jack Trainer, that helped the Big Green finish 9-1 last season. Quarterbacks Derek Kyler and Jared Garbino are both ready to roll and hope to improve on the success the tandem achieved last season. Dartmouth will look to start the season that Garbino has dubbed the Revenge Tour off strong in their campaign to amend last season's only blemish against Princeton. The Elis will open up the season hosting Holy Cross on Saturday at the Yale Bowl, which will feature a key difference for the first time in its 105-year history. Artificial turf. The team has responded positively to the change of playing surfaces, and Captain J.P. Shofi has said that the team feels fast on it. Junior quarterback Kurt Rawlings is ready to go after suffering a serious lower leg injury last year that ended his campaign early. This year, Yale features 28 seniors who are hungry to reclaim the title that they were mostly unable to defend last year due to injury. The defense is looking to bounce back after a dismal season. Holy Cross will be a good litmus test in the opener for a team that many have winning the Ivy League this season. Penn will go on the road to take on the Delaware Blue Hens to kick off their 2019 season. The Blue Hens are coming off their first loss of the season after winning their first two games. The Quakers will feature a quarterback change from last year, electing to start Nick Robinson over last year's starter, junior Ryan Glover. At running back, senior Karakin Brooks should receive a bulk of the carries after a season where he rushed for 898 yards and eight touchdowns. Fifth-year senior safety Sam Phillippe returns to the Quakers after an injury in the first game of the season last year kept him out for the rest of the season. With the Blue Hens looking to bounce back after a tough loss last week, the Quakers will certainly have their hands full on Saturday. The Brown Bears very nearly hit rock bottom last season, going 1-9 and, and winless in Ivy League play. The Bears will open this year up, traveling to Smithfield, Rhode Island, to take on new head coach James Perry's former team, the Bryant Bulldogs. Bryant sported a 6-5 record under Perry last year, but has had a rough start to the season, losing all three of their games by at least 14 points. At quarterback, Brown could either play Boston College transfer and also James Perry's nephew, E.J. Perry IV, or incumbent starter Michael McGovern. One could argue that there is nowhere to go but up for Brown. However, a loss on Saturday might have people changing their tune.
The reigning Ivy League champion Princeton Tigers open up the campaign to defend their title against the 1-2 Butler Bulldogs at home this Saturday. The quarterback position seems very up in the air for the Tigers with seniors Kevin Davidson and Zachary Keller both figuring to log some playing time in. Both looked impressive during the brief times they were on the field last season, and Keller will be looked at as the short yardage option now that 2018 starter John Lovett has graduated. Junior Colin Eady will look to build on his impressive performance from last season that saw him carry the ball for 93 times and never get tackled for a loss. On defense, Captain Jake Strain will look to lead a defensive line that was a vital part of last season's undefeated campaign. The Tigers will look to start off their season strong by securing the win and keep their 10-game winning streak alive. The Harvard Crimson will begin their 2019 season traveling to Southern California to take on the San Diego Toreros. Junior Jake Smith seems primed and ready to take the reins at quarterback for the Crimson this year, but freshman Kirk Castile and Charlie Dean should be right on his tail for playing time. Junior Aaron Champlin rushed for a lead-leading 1,053 yards while adding 10 touchdowns on the ground. On defense, last year's leading tackler Jordan Hill returns, as well as defensive back Wesley Augsbury, who had six interceptions in 2018. Given that the team is only returning 10 starters, experience is definitely a weak spot on this team, but they seem poised to make a run this year. And look for them to start it off with a bang against the 0-2 Toreros. Week 3 saw MEAC teams facing a variety of opponents, with three sides winning their matchups. Florida A&M defeated Fort Valley State 57-20, Delaware State crushed Lincoln of Pennsylvania 58-12, and the number 15 A&T Aggies just got by Charleston Southern 27-21. A&T scored 21 fourth quarter points to pull out the victory, helped in large part by a workmanlike performance by Jermaine Martin. The redshirt junior carried the ball 25 times for 299 yards and two touchdowns of 84 and 76 yards respectively. Kicker Nick Ruiz also had a critical part to play in the win going 4 for 4 on field goals with his longest splitting the uprights from 46 yards. In other action, Morgan State lost 62-12 to number 2 JMU. Norfolk State got smashed by Coastal Carolina 46-7, and Miami shut out Bethune-Cookman 63-0. Also, South Carolina State lost to South Florida 55-16, NC Central lost a nail-biter to Gardner-Webb 21-12, and Howard lost the battle of the real HU to Hampton 41-20. Taking a look at the standings after the first three weeks in the MEAC, a and and South Carolina State are on top at 2-1, followed by Delaware State, the Rattlers of A&M, and Bethune-Cookman at 1-1. Norfolk State 6 at 1 and 2, while Morgan State, Howard, and the NC Central Eagles are still looking for their first wins of the 2019 season. Coming up in week four, seven MEAC schools will take the field looking for victory as we hit the quarter pole of the season. North Carolina Central will look to their first win of the year against D2 side Elizabeth City State. Morgan State will travel to West Point to take on Army, while Norfolk State travels to Big Sky Country to face Montana State. In two MEAC SWAC games, the Wildcats of Bethune-Cookman will take on the Delta Devils of Mississippi Valley State, and A&M will host 1-2 Southern. The feature game of the week will be the first MEAC conference game of 2019 as Howard looks for its first win of the season as they travel to take on the Hornets of Delaware State. For the SES Conference Whip Round, I'm David Hassagan. Welcome to Week 4, and what a week ahead as the conference looks to solidify itself as the best in the FCS as they take on some of the best teams in the league, including a top five matchup. Taking a look back at last week's games, South Dakota lost a heartbreaker against Houston Baptist in a game that featured 1,238 yards of total offense. Western Illinois gave number eight Montana State all they could handle as they came up just short of the upset. Penguin Nation improved to 3-0 for the first time since 2012 with their win against Duquesne. Indiana State got their first victory of the season against Eastern Kentucky behind their third straight 200-yard rushing game. Southern Illinois, despite being down 14-0 and losing their starting quarterback on the second play of the game, came back to win against UT Martin. Illinois State beat their in-state rival, Eastern Illinois, in the Mid-American Classic. South Dakota State took care of business against Drake. And finally, North Dakota State passed their first big test of the season with flying colors as they went on the road and destroyed number 18 Delaware. Looking ahead at this week's games, 9 out of 10 teams are in action, with 8 of these teams wrapping up their non-conference schedule as the third annual Missouri Valley Big Sky Conference Championship is in full force with 5 games on tap. 
The Big Sky leads the series 3-1 as number 8 Northern Iowa hosts Idaho State. South Dakota travels to Northern Colorado. Number 3 South Dakota State welcomes Southern Utah. Number 15 Illinois State takes on Northern Arizona at home. And finally, in the game of the week, the number one Bison have an opportunity to show why they are the best team in the league as they host number four, UC Davis. Other conference games this week include Indiana State hosting Eastern Illinois. Missouri State looks for their first victory of the season as they welcome number seven, Kennesaw State. The Salukis look to make three in a row as they travel to FBS Arkansas State. And Western Illinois looks to break their three-game losing streak as they host Tennessee Tech. Now it's time for the Conference Players of the Week. Offensive honors goes to South Dakota quarterback Austin Simmons, who set school single-game records for yards, attempts, and completions as he finished with 48 out of 65 passes for a whopping 537 yards and a career tie tying four touchdowns. Defensive honors goes to Anoki Mawala, who dominated the line of scrimmage, recording eight tackles, including two sacks, and forced two fumbles on the game's final drive. And finally, special teams honors goes to Bison kicker Griffin Krosa, who finished the game with five extra points and two field goals, including a career-high 46-yarder. For the Missouri Valley Conference, I'm Brian Sullivan. The NEC is in full swing and there's no stopping the excitement. The Dukes were held to only 206 total yards and an All-American running back A.J. Hines to only 37 rushing yards as Duquesne was beaten by Youngstown State decisively, 34-14. This Saturday, the Dukes travel to Dayton to take on a Flyers team that almost fell to Robert Morris. Will Parr and Hines get back on track against a Dayton defense that can be susceptible to the run and pass? The Dukes defense has a tough task ahead of them trying to control Jack Cook and Sean Prophet, who both looked great against the Colonials. St. Francis hosts Columbia after coming off a dominant performance against Merrimack. Jason Brown threw for 176 yards and three touchdowns as the Red Flash beat the Warriors 42-14. This is Columbia's first game of the year, but it's coming off back-to-back -back winning seasons. The Red Flash will have to contain receiver Josh Wainwright, who's returning from an injury. The offensive line will have their hands full with a defensive end, Daniel DiLorenzo, who is coming off a season where he recorded nine and a half sacks. After dropping two straight, Merrimack looks to turn it around against Mayville State. After a decent start against St. Francis, the Warriors offense couldn't get anything going. Christian Carter will have to protect the football better after throwing three interceptions. Central Connecticut is off to a strong start of the season by winning three straight games. Against Valparaiso, Keontae Lucas exploded for 190 yards and two touchdowns. The Blue Devils have to travel to Eastern Michigan to take on an Eagles team that is led by quarterback Mike Glass III. The Blue Devil defense will have their work cut out for them trying to stop Glass, who has 841 yards and eight touchdowns for the season. Long Island University is back in action this week as they battle Sacred Heart in this NEC matchup. The Pioneers quarterback Marshy had a spectacular performance against Lafayette, throwing for 407 yards and six touchdowns. In their one game of the season, the Sharks were roughed up by FCS powerhouse South Dakota State. They will need quarterback Clay Bethard to step up if they have any hopes of competing in the NEC. Their defense will be tested this week not only through the air, but also on the ground having to stop Julius Chestnut. St. Francis isn't the only NEC team facing Ivy League competition. The Bulldogs host Brown in the Bears' first action of the season. Brian has started 0-3 by dropping their last one to Fordham. After leading for three quarters, the Bulldogs couldn't hold off the Rams, who scored 23 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. Brian was held to only 238 yards of offense. That needs to improve if they have any chance of competing. Wagner was dominated on the road by Stony Brook 26-10. Alexander Stevens had a solid game throwing for 242 yards and a touchdown, but the Wagner rushing attack was non-existent with only 17 yards on the ground. Their next opponent won't be any easier as the Seahawks take on Florida Atlantic. Don't let the 1-2 and two record of Florida Atlantic fool you. Their two losses were against ranked teams. The Seahawks have to get their rushing attack going if they have any chance of competing on this one. McKenzie was only given the ball three times and held to only four yards against Stony Brook. Hopefully, he will be relied on more in this game. 
Robert Morris is coming off a heartbreaking loss to Dayton. The Colonials threatened in the fourth quarter, but a late interception ruined any chance of victory. Their next opponent is the VMI Cadets. The Colonials will have their hands full trying to contain quarterback Reese Udinski, who has been putting together a really good season. However, in their two FCS contests this season, VMI has shown that teams can move the ball against them in the air as well as on the ground. We'll see if George Martin and Elijah Jackson can capitalize on this. Well, have fun watching the games. I'll see you next time. I'm Scott Glennon. Welcome to the last week of non-conference play in the Ohio Valley Conference. Every team has one last warm-up before the rivalries start up again for 2019. The two ranked OVC teams, Southeast Missouri and Jacksonville State, have very winnable games on the slate. SEMO hosts West Virginia State, while the Gamecocks, fresh off the come-from-behind win over number four Eastern Washington, hosts North Alabama. Eastern Illinois looks for his first win against Indiana State, who knocked off Eastern Kentucky last week. This week, those Colonels travel to Presbyterian in search of win number two on the year. Tennessee State warms up for conference play with a home date against Arkansas Pine Bluff, while Tennessee Tech looks for its third win of the year against Western Illinois. Murray State battles Moorhead State, while Austin P battles an old OVC foe in East Tennessee State. Stay with us next week as we preview week one of the Ohio Valley Conference schedule. For the FCS Whip Around, I'm Luke Jackson. What is up, Patriot League fans? I'm Scott Churchson, and here's your FCS Whip Around for week three. We went two and four this week, but there was the blowout of the year in one of those wins. The Hoyas, who crushed Maris in week one 43-3, decided this week to put up a little bit of Madden-like numbers against Catholic, 69 to nothing. 567 yards to 72, 26 first downs to four, and not a single punt. A lot to be excited going into their week off. Also getting a win was the Rams over Bryant 29-14 for their first win of the year. On the losing end was Lafayette losing to Sacred Heart in a slugfest 56-40, the Bison losing to Nova 45-10, Colgate loses on the road 38-10 to William & Mary, and the Mountain Hawks fall to UC Davis in California. So, player of the week time on both ends of the ball. Starting on offense, it was pretty easy for me. Lafayette quarterback Ryan Shoemaker. He picks up 411 passing yards with two TDs, ran for 134 yards, and rushed for two more in the loss to Sacred Heart. Defense was a little harder for me as there weren't really that many standouts, but I'm going with Fordham freshman DB uh, Packer Spillers, six tackles, two sacks. Going into this week is a light schedule with only four games on tap. One and one Holy Cross is in Connecticut to take on Yale in Yale's first game of the year. Holy Cross met up with Yale last year in Yale's first game of the season, then en route to, en route to a 31-28 win on the road, but looked to Yale to rebound despite an up-and-down 5-5 five and five record last season. Colgate, who has struggled out of the gate, will be looking for its first win of the year at the Hamilton against Maine. The Raiders, whose rushing defense has averaged just over 300 yards a game, might catch a break against a Black Bear running game that's only averaged 60 yards on the ground in the past few games. Now, Lafayette will be taking on Albany on the road. Albany lost in a heartbreaker in overtime last week, 38-35, and currently sit at 1-2 on the season. That Leopard defense is still a concern of mine after three games and giving up almost an average of 450 yards, but I had to love that offense last week. This will in fact be the first ever meeting between the Leopards and the Great Danes. And lastly, Fordham will be looking to build on last week's win to get back to 500 by taking on Stony Brook. The Seawolves sit at 2-1, under 14-year head coach slash two-time Big South Coach of the Year, Chuck Priori. This is going to be a close game, I, I think, but I love what Zach Davis did last week with 140 yards on the ground and a touchdown. Let me just say one thing as I close this out. This weekend is my birthday. So, how about giving me a little bit of Patriot League birthday gift love and the league goes 3-1 this week. I like 4-0, but, you know, 3-1, I don't think that's unreasonable, right? Anyway, that's it for Week 3 FCS Whip Around. I'm Scott Church and stay awesome. I'm Alex Marinoni with your Week 3 Pioneer League Whip Around. Week 3 saw the Pioneer League go 4-3 and three and out of conference play and a thrilling comfort behind victory in our first conference matchup of the season. In this one, Maris pulled out the comeback in defeating Stetson 26-23. Maris led most of this game but blew a 19-10 second half lead. 
Stetson comes back in the fourth quarter to take a 23-19 lead, but Mayor's backup quarterback Luke Strand hit Anthony Olivencia on a 75-yard touchdown strike to give Mayor's the lead and the win. Olivencia finished with four catches and 150 yards and two touchdowns. Makai Johnson finished with 125 yards and a score as well for the Red, so Red Fox. Stetson quarterback Gavin DeFilippo finished 36-60 for 301 yards and a touchdown. For the rest of the league, Central Connecticut beats up Valparaiso 42-13 as the Crusaders gave up 315 yards on the ground. Number 3 South Dakota State runs through Drake 38-10 as the Jackrabbits rush for 369 yards and three scores. Dayton picks up a win against Robert Morris 34-31 as tight end Adam Troutman has another nice day with five catches for 82 yards and a touchdown. Moorhead State crushes Kentucky Christian 73-34. This one saw Eagles running backs Isaiah Aguero and Yovan Smith combine for 221 yards and four touchdowns, and quarterback Mark Pappas add two more through the air. Butler drops a heartbreaker to Taylor University 17-14. Taylor's third quarter field goal proved to be the winner. Davidson blanks West Virginia Wesleyan 41-0 as sophomore running back Eli Turner Jr. Took, his advan took advantage of his seven carries as he took it for 110 yards and a touchdown. And Jacksonville picked up their first one of the year over Presbyterian 30-20 led by the running duo of Calvin Turner Jr. and Garnett Nicholas as they combined for 226 yards and two touchdowns in the victory. Now let's take a quick look at the standings after week three. Mayor sits at top with the only conference victory last weekend and an overall record of 1-1. One one. Next is the league's two remaining undefeated teams in Davidson and Dayton at 3-0 and 2-0 apiece. Behind them is Moorhead State, followed by Jacksonville and Butler, each with wins to their resume. After that, it's 0-2 San Diego, 0-2 Valparaiso, and 0-3 Drake and Stetson rounds out the bottom with the only conference loss of the year. For the week coming up, the entire Pioneer League will be out of conference again with the number of games against the Ivy League. Marist will host Cornell in Poughkeepsie at 12 o'clock. Dartmouth heads to Jacksonville to take on the Dolphins. San Diego is back in action as they host Harvard. Butler has their hands full as they head to New Jersey to take on Princeton. Dayton looks to remain perfect as they are set to host Dickensie. Stetson looks to bounce back from their tough loss to take on Western New England at home. 3-0 Davidson heads, north, heads to North Carolina to take on Campbell. Moorhead State will travel to Kentucky to take on Murray State. And Valparaiso looks to get into the win column as they head to Missouri to take on 2-0 Truman State. For the Pioneer League, I'm Alex Marinoni. I'm Troy Anthony, bringing you the football game plan whip around for the FCS's Southern Conference. The SoCon had two interconference matchups and a few SBF showdowns this past weekend. Let's kick, let's kick things off with the Chattanooga Mocs, dropping the ball big time against the Tennessee Volunteers by a score of 45-0. to zero. Mox quarterback Nick Tiano would only complete four out of his 16 pass attempts for 40 yards and would combine with backup quarterback Drayton Arnold to throw four interceptions on the day. The Mox are currently ranked four, fourth in the conference at 1-2. and two. It won't get any easier for Chattanooga next week as they host the number two ranked 2-1 two James Madison Dukes at 4 o'clock. In another FCS-FBS matchup, the Virginia Tech Hokies would defeat the Furman Paladins 24-17. The Paladins would lead at the halftime 14-3, receiving rushing touchdowns from running back Rev Devin Abrams, who ended the day with 72 yards, and quarterback Darren Granger, who only had 19 yards rushing on 15 attempts. Coming out at halftime, this game was all Hokies. With two quick touchdowns in the third quarter, the Hokies were up 17-14 with no looking back. The Paladins allowed running back Keyshawn King to carry the ball 12 times for 119 yards, an average of 9.9 .9 yards per carry. And wide receiver Trey Turner, five rushes for 68 yards and a score through the air and on the ground. Furman falls one spot in the stats in the FCS's stats top 25 rankings to number 17. At 1-2, they are currently fifth in the conference. They begin conference play next week as they host the 2-1 Mercer Bears at 1 o'clock. In the final FBS matchup of the weekend for the SoCon, the Citadel Bulldogs would head to take on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. The Bulldogs would pull off the upset by a score of 27-24, and what a game it was. The Bulldogs held the lead the entire game, and the Yellow Jackets would hit a 34-yard field goal from kicker Brenton King to send the game to overtime. Georgia Tech would get the ball first in overtime and would need King to hit a 46-yarder. Unfortunately, King could not come through for the Yellow Jackets this time. The Bulldogs would take their overtime drive and seal the victory on the leg of Jacob Godek in his game-winning 37-yard field goal. 
The Citadel's option offense proved too much for Tech to handle, as the Bulldogs dominated time of possession 41 minutes to 18. With this victory, the Citadel jumped into number 25 in the Stats FCS rankings. The 1 and 2 Bulldogs are currently 6th in the conference and play host to the 0 and 3 Charleston Southern Buccaneers this Saturday at 6 o'clock. The Western Carolina Catamounts pl were played tough this weekend by the North Greenville Crusaders, but the Catamounts would ultimately pull off the victory, 20 to 17. It took the Catamounts until the fourth quarter to finally see a lead with a six-yard strike from quarterback Will Jones to tight end Clayton Bardall. Jones would go 27 of 37 on the day for 207 yards and a touchdown. He would also rush 16 times for 43 yards and a touchdown. Wide receiver Daquan Patton would be Jones' main target on the day as he hauled in 12 passes for 82 yards. The 1-2 and two Catamounts are currently 8th in the conference. They'll have a chance to improve their conference standing next week as they head to take on the 1-2 Chattanooga Mocs. In the first of our two interconference matchups, the Sanford Bulldogs would defeat the Walford Terriers on the road 21-14. The Bulldogs quarterback, Chris Alodokin, would pass for 224 yards and one touchdown on 17 of 24 completions. He would also rush for 12 times, 77 yards and a touchdown. That rushing score came on a 30-yard dash in the third quarter, ultimately steal sealing the game. Sanford seemingly has Wofford's number as this is the 12th victory in 17 meetings. Prior to this game, Wofford was ranked 21st in the Stats FCS Top 25, they have since fallen out of the rankings. Sanford is 1-2 and, and is now ranked third in the conference. And at 0-2, Wofford is ranked ninth. This Saturday, Sanford plays host to the 2-1 Alabama A&M Bulldogs at 7 o'clock. And Wofford plays host to the 1-2 Gardner-Webb Bulldogs at 6 o'clock. The Mercer Bears would lose their first game of the season at home this past week to the Austin P. Governors, 48-34. The Bears played a tight game until late in the third quarter when the Governors would run away with it. Bears quarterback Robert Riddle would go 29-47 of 47 for 287 yards and four touchdowns. He also threw two interceptions. Wide receiver David Durden would be Riddle's main target on the day, with nine catches for 129 yards and two touchdowns. The Bears are now 2-1 and, and hold the number one spot in the conference. Next up for the Bears is an interconference matchup as they head to take on the 1-2, number 17th stats FCS ranked Furman Paladins this Saturday at 1 o'clock. In our final interconference matchup of the week, the VMI Cadets would defeat the ETSU Buccaneers 31-24 in overtime. This game would go back and forth into overtime, where VMI would put up the go-ahead 21-yard touchdown from Reese Udinsky to, Dejav to Javion Lara. ETSU could not respond, and the game would be over. Udinsky would throw for 281 yards and two touchdowns on 64 passing attempts. Alex Ramsey would also contribute two rushing touchdowns for the Cadets. ETSU's Jake running back Jacob Sailors would have a day on the ground, rushing for 112 yards and a touchdown on only nine carries. VMI is now second in the conference at 2-1, and, and ETSU is now seventh at 1-2. This Saturday, VMI will play host to the 0-3 Colonials at 1 o'clock and ETSU will be hosting the 2-1 Austin P. Governors at 7.30. This has been your football game plan whip around for the FCS's Southern Conference. I'm Troy Anthony. I'm Dan McGillicuddy for Football Game Plan with the Southland Conference Week 3 Recap. As with every week, the FCS rankings are based on Stats FCS. We'll pick it up with the conference showdown between the number 14th ranked team, the Central Arkansas Bears, at home versus at Abilene Christian Wildcats. This was a hard-fought game throughout as the Wildcats pushed the Bears to the brink, eventually falling short 31-30 after kicker Blair Zepeda missed on a possible game-clinching 46-yard field goal with 35 seconds left. He had an up-and-down game, hitting from 51, 42, and 33 yards, but missing from 37 and 46 yards. The Wildcats forced the Bears into three turnovers, winning that battle 3-1, but couldn't stop the Bears in the fourth quarter as they put up 22 points on the Cats' D. This is the third consecutive fourth quarter comeback for the Bears. The Bears only held the lead once, and that's all they needed when Carlos Blackman took it in from three yards out for the go-ahead score with one minute and 30 seconds left. It was Blackman's second TD of the game, 
His other was a 10-yard catch from quarterback Braylon Smith. Smith went 36 for 53, one TD, one interception, and 367 yards passing. Both teams moved the ball well, with Christian going for 322 yards in the air and 122 on the ground. The Bears weren't as productive on the ground as they only had 47 yards, but 367 in the air. The Bears traveled to Hawaii to take on the Warriors, while Abilene hosts McNeese State in another conference game. The Houston Baptist Huskies and the University of South Dakota Coyotes combined for 105 points Saturday in South Dakota, with the Huskies scoring the last to win 53-52. to The Huskies amassed 596 total yards, while giving up 642 yards to the Coyotes on 100 plays. Bailey Zapp was 41 for 53, 513 yards, 5 TDs, and 3 interceptions. Dre Shawn Manyweather had 2 TDs rushing, and re one receiving, and three wideouts topped the century mark in receiving yards. Ben Ratzliff had 12 catches for 155 yards and three TDs. Jarrett Stearns had 10 for 114, and Gamar Gertie Brito had nine catches for 103, 103 yards and one TD. Miniweather scored the TD with 114 left, leaving them down by one. Head coach Vic Shealy decided to go for two, and it worked, giving them the one-point lead. Defensive end Andre Walker had four sacks and five tackles for loss. The Huskies host Northwestern State on Saturday, the first conference game for both teams. The Southeastern Louisiana Lions put up a valiant effort, stepping up in class against the SEC's Ole Miss Rebels. The Lions trailed all game, kept cutting into the lead, and trailed by five heading into the fourth quarter. But two field goals by the Rebels put the game out of reach. The Lions gave up 220 yards rushing and 239 passing while only producing 66 on the ground and a respectable 309 in the air. They also lost the turnover battle 4-2. Chase on Virgil was 29 for 44, 309 yards, two TDs, and three interceptions. The D was led by the effort of Isaac Ademi Berglund, two sacks, three tackles for loss, and forced three fumbles. The Lions return home to face Lamar to open the conference for both squads on Saturday. The Sam Houston State Bearcats got a safety with three minutes and 38 seconds left in the game to cut the University of North Dakota Fighting Hawks lead to four, but couldn't get any closer, losing 27 to 23. Three interceptions and a lost fumble derailed the Cats in this game as both defenses were the story of the game, forcing 17 combined punts. All in all, it was an exciting game as the Hawks led 14-zip before the Cats tied it up, only to go down 27-14, and then their comeback fell short. The Cats return home to kick off their conference schedule as they host the Incarnate Word Cardinals this weekend. McNeese State appeared to be cruising to a stress-free victory over visiting Braves of Alcorn State as they led 17-0 heading into the fourth quarter. The Braves scored two TDs in the last four minutes of the game to make the Cowboys sweat it out 17-14. This was another game dominated by the defense as both teams combined for 19 punts and five turnovers. Cody Oregon was efficient, 19 for 29, two TDs and 191 yards and no turnovers. The defense was stellar, forcing three turnovers, and the D had three sacks, forced Braves quarterback Felix Harper into two interceptions on 28 attempts. Javon Burris had 12 tackles, Carlos Scott had 10, two for a loss and one sack, and they spearheaded the defensive effort. The Cowboys head to Abilene Christian for their first conference game on Saturday. It is never easy going into a battle against an SEC foe on the road as the Lamar Cardinals were steamrolled by Texas A&M 63-3. The Cards could only muster 197 yards while the Aggies racked up 633 yards. It was total domination as the Cards trailed 34-0 before getting a field goal with five minutes left in the third quarter. The Nichols Colonels used a 29-point third quarter effort to fuel their 42-35 victory over the Panthers of Prairie View A&M. Trailing 21-6 at the half, quarterback Chase Forcade and wide receiver Dejon Dixon went to work. Forcade had two TD runs and threw two TD passes to Dixon to go up 35-21, entering the final stanza. They traded TDs, before the Panthers scored with five minutes and 50 seconds left, and the D held them at bay, forcing a turnover on downs. Forcade finished 17 for 22, 229 yards and two TDs, and Dixon had seven catches for 126 yards and two TDs. 
Although the Colonels gave up 464 yards, their defense was the difference as they forced four turnovers, two in that massive third quarter. Allen Pittman had nine tackles, one for loss, one sack, one forced fumble, and Kevin Moore had seven tackles, a forced fumble, and an interception. The Colonels traveled to Stephen F. Austin on Saturday to open the conference for both schools. It looked promising for the Northwestern State Demons as they were leading the LSU Tigers 7-3 after one quarter and trailed 17-14 late in the half, only to see the Bayou Bengals rip off 42 straight points to win 65-14. The D held LSU to 122 yards rushing, but gave up 488 in the air. Shelton Epler was 21 for 28, 228 yards, two TDs and no interceptions, and Ryan Reed led the defense with 10 tackles. Up next for the Demons is a road conference game at Houston Baptist on Saturday. The Stephen F. Boston Lumberjacks were oh so close to their first victory, but dropped a thriller in overtime, 45-38 to the Southern Utah Thunderbirds. The Jacks scored the go-ahead TD with three minutes and 13 seconds left, but the Birds tied it two minutes later and won it in OT with an 11-yard TD run. Trey Self passed for 290 yards, two TDs, one interception, but was sacked five times by the Birds, while the Jacks only mustered two sacks and allowed 409 yards in the air. The Jacks trailed 10-zip, then 17-3 before a 14-point rally at the end of the half to not the score. The, J the Jacks took their first lead midway through the third, and the teams traded TDs until the Birds won it in overtime. It was a great effort by the Jacks, but they still fell short. The good news is that none of these losses are conference games as they prepare to host Nichols Saturday. The bad news is that Nichols are one of the better teams in the conference. Now to the players of the week. Offensive player of the week is Houston Baptist quarterback Bailey Zapp, who had 513 yards passing. Five TD passes to lead the Huskies to one-point victory over the University of South Dakota. Defensive Player of the Week is Zapp's teammate, Andre Walker. He had four sacks, six tackles, five for a loss, three quarterback hits for the Huskies. His late quarterback pressure forced an interception to seal the deal for the Huskies. Special Teams Player of the Week, Central Arkansas place kicker, Hayden Ray, who hit on all three of his field goal attempts and his two extra points. The last one being the deciding point in a one-point home win, 31-30 over Abilene Christian. A quick look at the polls courtesy of Stats FCS shows Nichols drops a spot to 13th, Central Arkansas remains at 14th, Southeastern Louisiana up two spots to 21st, McNeese State, Sam Houston, Lamar, and Houston Baptist all had honorable mention. In closing, I'd like to dish out a game ball. This doesn't go to a player or players. Arkansas State head coach Blake Anderson's wife, Wendy, passed away on August 19th after losing her battle to breast cancer. State traveled to Athens, Georgia to take on the third-ranked Bulldogs, and the hometown fans staged a pink out in honor of Wendy. Anderson was overwhelmed by the display and compassion showed by the fans. The game ball goes to the Bulldog fans at the University of Georgia. Well done, folks. I'm Dan McGillicuddy, and that's a wrap on week three. Enjoy the games, everybody, and see you next week. I'm J.J. Josephson with your SWAC whip around. Jackson State's Tyson Alexander was a key part of the Tigers' offense as JSU defeated Tennessee State at the 30th Annual Southern Heritage Classic. Alexander was named the Southwestern Athletic Conference Newcomer of the Week, totaling 87 yards and one touchdown on just seven carries. Jackson State gashed Tennessee State for 333, 338 yards on the ground and rolled to a 49-44 win at the Liberty Bowl. The 49 points scored by JSU was the most points scored in the Southern Heritage Classic, ending a six-game losing streak to TSU. Jackson State did not waste any time getting on the board as return specialist John Littles returned the opening kickoff 100 yards to the house to set the tone early for the Tigers, giving him the nod as the special team player of the week award in the SWAC conference. It was a huge win for JSU as they can enjoy a week off with a week four bye. Alabama A&M linebacker Armani Holloway was a major factor in the Bulldogs 31-24 win over North Alabama, racking up 11 tackles one sack and five TFLs. 
The Bulldogs showed some major fight, erasing an 18-0 halftime deficit while scoring 31 unanswered points in the second half, moving to 2-1 on the season. It wasn't just the Bulldogs' defense who shined this past weekend. As the 6'1", 218-pound senior workhorse A&M running back, Jordan Bentley earns Offensive Player of the Week honors, rushing for 126 yards and three touchdowns on 26 carries. He also caught three passes and 37 yards and a score. This was the first time in 31 years that Alabama A&M beat North Alabama and have their sights set on 1-2 Sanford as they travel to Seibert Stadium for a tough road matchup that this week. Prairie View, who is now 1-2 on the season after stalling in the second half, allowing Nichols State to score 29 unanswered points. The Panthers were led on defense by junior linebacker Treshawn Smith, totaling a whopping 14 tackles and a pair of sacks. Prairie View was outgained by only two yards, 465 to 463 in total yards, but turnovers and penalties is what ultimately led them to come up just short. They now turn their attention to a very important league game as they head east to take on defending SWAC champions Alcorn State in a game that has been circled on their schedule since day one. Kickoff is set for 6 p.m. from Lorman, Mississippi. Defending Southwestern Athletic Conference champs Alcorn State came up just short with a late offensive push and strong defensive effort losing to McNeese State 17-14. The Braves' defense did all they could in the second half by shutting out McNeese State. Led by junior linebacker Damian Anderson, who had a career-high night with 12 tackles, as well as holding McNeese to 1-for-15 mark on third-down conversions. Alcorn couldn't quite put it together offensively with key injuries to star players Noah Johnson and Deshaun Waller. Alcorn State now sits at 1-2 and two on the season with a big conference home showdown versus Prairie View this Saturday night at 6 p.m. Southern University showed up with their game face on in the Pete Richardson Classic, absolutely manhandling Edward Water by a score of 61-0, moving to 1-2 and two on the season, currently sitting in third place in the West. After starting the season off to a, off to a disappointing 0-2 start, the Jaguars wasted no time getting on the board. Running back Devin Ben found pay dirt less than three minutes into the game, followed up by Jaguars quarterback Ladarius Skelting, rushing touchdown, and then a safety. They never looked back, up 16-0. End of the first quarter, 40-0 at halftime. Southern can... Southern can't enjoy that blowout win too long as they have their eyes on Florida A&M, who is currently 1-1 one and, one, and coming off their own blowout win of their own. This should be a very interesting game as two tough teams square off, both needing a win, trying to build off their big momentum wins just a week ago. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff rolled to a 53-15 win over Langston in their Saturday night home opener at Simmons Bank Field. The Golden Lions have already matched their total wins for all of 2018 season and won back-to-back -back games for the first time in five years. Arkansas Pine Bluff's dual quarterback system proved to work as both, as both Skyler Perry and Shannon Patrick combined for 300 plus yards in the air and four touchdowns total. Arkansas at Pine Bluff returns to action this Saturday at Tennessee State in a game that is expected to be close right down to the wire. Texas Southern continue the season struggles as it was just one of those nights for the Tigers as Louisiana dominated the game from the first snap and didn't look back while cruising to an easy win, 77-6. TSU's defense was almost non-existent as red-hot Louisiana, led by running back Elijah Mitchell, went up and down the field all night long. 
Texas Southern couldn't ask for a better time for a bye week after this embarrassing showing and returns to action September 28th at Houston Baptist. Alabama State falls to seventh ranked Kennesaw State Owls, taking advantage of two Hornets turnovers, winning easily by a score of 42-7 Saturday night at ASU Stadium. It was no easy task for the one and two Hornets who faced the number 11 ranked offense in the country, tallying their average with 520 yards of total offense while holding Alabama State to just 54 total plays of their own. Bama State led by Christian Clark had 11 tackles at the defensive end position and was buzzing around in the backfield all night long. They have to get over that loss quickly as next week they host Grambling State at home in the Southwest Athletic Conference opener. The Hornets need a conference win to stay alive and be relevant in the East, and head coach Donald Hill Ellie should have the Hornets players fired up for this showdown. That just about wraps it up for this week's Whip Around Preview for the Southwestern Athletic Conference. I'm JJ Josephson, and I'll see you in the trenches.